We're here at the SCS in Houston, Texas. My name is Tom Nguyen. I'm an adult cardiothoracic surgeon here in Houston, Texas. And we're very fortunate to have very uh, distinguished panelists uh, here this morning to talk about the sutureless valve. Uh, we have first Dr. Patrick McCarthy. He's the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Northwestern. And then Dr. Bort Gursak, who's the head of cardiothoracic surgery at the University in Slovenia. Now, as we know, there are a lot of great treatment options for aortic stenosis, and more recently, we have transcatheter options, as well as a gold standard surgical open uh, aortic valve replacement. So why is there a need for sutureless or rapid deployment valves? Dr. McCarthy, what are your thoughts? So we're still doing lots of aortic valve replacement, and so why not uh, take the latest technology and sort of make a hybrid of it, take our well-performing aortic valves, uh, surgical valves, and then add the benefits of what we've learned with uh, rapid deployment using transcatheter valves. And so it's kind of a natural combination. Dr. Grossack, do you have anything to add to that? I think it's a natural evolution. You know, so the people have a tendency to improve, to invent, and this is the next step in evolution of the surgical heart valves. Just a little bit of semantics. We hear terms sutureless valves and rapid deployment valves. You know, what's the difference? Well, sutureless, it really means that there are no sutures used after the deployment of the valve, and this is the Percival valve. While rapid deployment means that you can really deploy it fast, uh, but then you still need, uh, in this case, I think three sutures uh, to keep it uh, uh, in place. Dr. Dr. McCarthy, does it matter if you use three sutures at all, or does it matter if you have no sutures? What are your thoughts? Oh, it only takes a moment to uh, secure the three sutures, and so, um, you know, tying them or using uh, some sort of not tying device, it really, it doesn't have much in the way of time. So currently, FDA has approved uh, several sutureless or rapid deployment devices. What are the current ones in the market in the United States? So uh, the one that I have the experience with would be the Intuity valve that's made by Edwards Life Sciences, uh, but also Percival, as we'll be hearing about. Okay. Uh, I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into each of the valves. So the two valves I'd like to talk about this morning are the Intuity valve from Edwards and the Percival valve from Soren. Uh, and we'll start off with Dr. McCarthy, and he's going to give us a brief uh, let's talk on the Intuity valve. Uh, Dr. McCarthy. Thanks, Tom. So um, on the first slide, what we're looking at is a picture of the valve before and after deployment. It's not uh, deployed on the left and then after deployment on the right. Uh, the thing I like about the valve is that it basically leverages the decades of experience we have with the bovine pericardial valve. So the upper portion of the valve uh, is the same perimount valve that we've been using for many years. Um, when we talk about it after that too, what patients would you want to do that and why would you want to do this? Um, there's shorter cross clamp times and bypass times. It's very quick and easy to put it in. Uh, there's some evidence indicating that there's a, a larger aortic valve area because it really opens the LV outflow tract and it facilitates minimally invasive surgery. Uh, and also more complex operations. So if you're doing multiple coronary artery bypasses as well as uh, valve replacement as an example, then uh, you save that additional time. So I uh, have a video that I've prepared. It's an operation I did several years ago when it was still in the experimental uh, phase. So it's from uh, 2014 and um, this one uh, is showing a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve. It's filmed from a variety of different positions. This was a handheld camera. And so this is a standard aortotomy, which is what we use to do the valve. This is a patient that had a bicuspid aortic valve with right and left uh, fusion and a very heavily calcified valve. So um, the technique is to do the standard annular decalcification, which in this patient was really quite extensive. Uh, to, uh, to get all of that calcium out. You don't really think of it like a transcatheter aortic valve where you want that calcium there to help uh, seed it. Uh, sizing is really important, and so we use standard sizers to do this. This being a bicuspid aortic valve patient had a very dilated annulus, and it fit a 27. Preparation of the valve after sizing is really quick. Uh, this is at the back table with the nurses, and so they have to rinse the valve. It comes up on its holder, and then this is the deployment device that's being placed uh, inside it and then secured. 
Um, while they're doing that, we're placing uh, three sutures through the annulus uh, at the nadir, at the very lowest portion of each, con uh, each one of the three uh, sinuses. And, and this shows that uh, with the left on uh, the left as we look at this picture. So these are really guiding sutures. And then those are passed through the sewing ring of the valve. And at that point, you just parachute the valve down, seat it like you normally would, and then uh, you're gonna snug those three sutures down. Uh, you do have to take care to make sure that the snuggers aren't uh, on that holder there. Um, and you bring that down, and then you are going to deploy uh, the valve. And so uh, up on the handle end, uh, there is a balloon that you're going to slide down uh, into uh, the middle of the valve. You connect this so that you can pressurize the valve different pressures and different sizes of valves. This one is at five atmospheres. You hold it for 10 seconds, you count it out loud, uh, just to make sure that the valve is fully deployed uh, and you're nearly done. Then you just cut the three sutures that are on the holder and then you slide out the deployment uh, device, uh, tie the sutures down, and then you're gonna close your aortotomy the way you normally do. And uh, you're done. So the quickest cross climb time I ever did with one of these was 24 minutes. And uh, it can be uh, remarkably fast uh, in the right patient. Uh, this one probably would have taken longer because of all the calcification. So the, the valve, the, the Edwards intuitive valve, looks like a standard surgical valve, but with extension into the LVOT for anchoring purposes. Uh, have you encountered any potential problems with that, uh, mainly either pacemaker implantation or LVOT obstruction? Yeah, so we haven't had any LVO to, uh, LVOT obstruction. I do think twice about it if I have a, a mitral valve replacement uh, because it's going to deploy about a millimeter and a half to two uh, below the annulus. And so if you're right up against the sewing ring of a mitral valve, I would think twice about doing that. Although I have done it successfully and I know that I'm aware of about 30 patients in the US and I'm sure there are many more in Europe uh, where they have done that before. Uh, it's interesting, the pacemakers, the TRANSFORM trial is about to be published in the U.S. And so they did see what we thought was a higher risk for pacemakers than we normally would see. It was about 11%. It tended to happen in the patients with pre-existing bundle branch block. Uh, but that has not been the general experience. The experience in Europe, where it's been commercially approved for years, actually looks like more of a typical uh, rate for pacemakers, and I know at Northwestern we've done about 50 of these between the trial and, and recent, and we were running 4% pacemaker use. And so it's certainly um, not like a remarkably higher risk for pacemakers. Well, as surgeons, cardiologists, and patients, probably the most important thing that we're concerned about has to do with hemodynamics and also durability. What are your comments about that for this particular valve? Well, so the durability should be the same as the pericardial valves because that portion of it is really the same. It's only the part underneath that is different and that's how you essentially anchor it. So the durability of uh, tissue valves really is just dependent upon the age of the patient or primarily anyways. Um, and so it's actually quite good and it looks good at 20 years. Uh, uh, so uh, that aspect of it we're not too concerned about. Mike Borkin wrote a paper about the hemodynamics of the valve and uh, there's uh, certainly indications that the valve gradients look a little better with this and you might have uh, re appreciated when the, the cuff is deployed it does seem to open the outflow tract a little bit and so that may be part of it. We'll change gears a little bit and let's talk about the other FDA approved valve in the market, the Percival valve. Uh, Dr. Gersak uh, is a leader in the field and, and a proctor for the uh, valve implantation. Uh, Dr. Gersak, can you share some slides that you have on the, uh, the Percival valve? Um, the Percival valve is really a truly sutureless valve and um, it was engineered uh, to be a natural valve actually uh, so that the pericardium would be mounted on an atinal stent. And because the stent is really flexible, it gives uh, the option and the opportunity uh, that the valve is really behaving like a normal valve through the cardiac cycle. Uh, secondly, uh, the collapsing, because it's of obvious it's needed, is unique because uh, the valve is uh, collapsed and it's really enabling better visibility. 
And uh, what is important to say is that during the collapsing, the pericardium is not really touched at all, so the pericardium is intact. Uh, there is a larger clinical evidence uh, about the Percival valves, more than 180 peer-reviewed publications, and it's really the largest clinical evidence body for the sutures and rapid deployment valves, with more than 20,000 valves implanted over nine years of clinical experience, of course, mostly in Europe, and now uh, since 2016 in U.S. as well. Um, there are some things which are important to consider when you screen the patients for the Percival, uh, uh, because this uh, valve is somehow uh, uh, accommodating uh, different sizes, as you see here, 19 to 21 with one, uh, with, with one valve, and 21 to 23 with another one, and so on. Uh, it's necessary that you uh, determine what is the size of the annulus and the sinotubular junction, uh, that the valve will not be malpositioned on, that the valve will not be uh, misplaced afterwards. And the contraindications are important because if the patient have the unreasonable dilatation or dissection, uh, of course, it's not uh, possible to to, emplace this valve, uh, to, to, re to implant this valve. Uh, and uh, of course, if the patient have the hypersensitivity to the to the metal, I mean, to the cobalt alloys. Um, there are some implantation pearls uh, which are really facilitating the use in minimal invasive surgery. Uh, uh, there is a mass that the autotomy should be a little bit higher, which actually helps the surgeon in minimal invasive approaches that the autotomy is closer to them. Uh, then the guiding sutures, which you are going to see later during the video, are really uh, enabling correct positioning that the alignment of the annulus and the valve is going to be okay. Um, but of course there are some pitfalls. pitfalls. Uh, if you don't respect uh, those characteristics, uh, you may be in trouble. Uh, and also if you missize the valve, either if, if the valve is too small or too big, if it's too small you have a paraparabola leak, if it's too big it can lead to the increased risk of uh, pacemaker implantations, like all um, the other valves as well. And also there is a huge mistake if you try to tie the guiding sutures um, after the, the implantation. Uh, disadvantages, it's important to say that uh, there are some disadvantages, some as and few of them. Uh, one is oversizing for the pacemaker, and another one, which is also important, if the valve is positioned uh, too low into the outflow tract, uh, despite the fact that the pressure is not so, so big. Uh, also, reimbursement is still not available in many countries, which is a potential disadvantage. But there are also key advantages, uh, like facilitating minimal evasive procedures, especially right anterior thor thoracotomy. Uh, combined procedures reduce small annulus, calcified. And also, uh, we think that uh, at the present moment is the best surgical platform for the future valve in valve, because the valve is really just not in all stand and the pericardium leaflets mountain on it. Uh, this is the video, uh, which is actually um, reduced to 50% of the speed. Uh, when, I, when I did it, it was, it was too fast, I mean, to, to see. Uh, uh, so, uh, because the valve is really deployed very fast. So we have to do our totomy a little bit higher than normally, about five millimeter above the ST junction. Then you have the size of the leaflet normally. It's important to decalcify complete because you don't want to have the paravalvular leaks. The sizing is crucial. You have two sizers. One is transparent, which is passing through. It means the valve is not okay. And then the white one should not pass through the annulus, and this means this is the correct size. The sizing is really crucial, and uh, this is where you need some experience, obviously. Then you parachute the valve down, use the guiding sutures, and you see this is the right anterior thoracotomy with a two centimeter uh, opening, uh, which is really facilitating uh, the visibility. The deployment is really fast. As I mentioned, this is 50% speed. Uh, you just uh, do the outflow tract and inflow tract as well and then you remove the, this part of, of, uh, the, of the shaft. Uh, you need to balloon, but just four atmospheres uh, for 30 seconds uh, to, to make the ceiling optimal. And then you spec the valve. Of course, you see if all the leaflets are uh, correctly uh, aligned and there's some, let's say, uh, mis misalignment or whatever. And this is important to see how the valve is behaving uh, during the cardiac cycle is in vitro, and then you can see it's really flexible. So, so it means that there is a reduced stress, uh, first of all, on the commissures, and also that the annulus 
can really accommodate uh, all those uh, movements uh, of the valve, I mean, of the, of the cardiac cycle and the valve. Great. Well, I'm going I'm to ask you the same question that I asked Dr. McCarthy. So I, as clinicians and patients, what we really care about has to do with hemodynamics as well as durability. Um, what do you have to say about the personal valve regarding hemodynamics and durability? Well, the hemodynamics is really perfect. Uh, even in the smaller valves, uh, which is the 19 to 21, you can see really single digit uh, gradients. And what is important also, those gradients are going down in, in the course of years. So hemodynamically is really great. Uh, I think durability is not an issue because uh, as this, uh, Dr. McCarthy said, it's just a pericardial valve. So it's uh, just according to the age of the patient and whatever other conditions are. So, and there is one unique thing which is completely different than with the TAVI. So the TAVI you really crimp the pericardium, uh, you compress and you really destruct. But here in this valve, uh, for those few seconds when the valve is collapsed, there is no um, damage to the pericardium at all. A common, a common uh, uh, comment that I hear from other surgeons is that uh, the alleged benefit is that you have a decrease in cross clamp time and, and, uh, and cardiopulmonary bypass time from perhaps 60 minutes down to 25 minutes. But do you, either of you think that really matters, decreasing the cross clamp time from 60 minutes to 25 minutes from a clinical standpoint? Well, I think that if it helps you do minimally invasive surgery and, you know, various studies and meta-analyses are looking at that and, and show some benefits to doing the operation minimally invasive, and it does make it just a little bit more facile to be able to do this um, with that. So um, it does also decrease the cross clamp time, and, and so if it's just an isolated aortic valve, that may not be as important, but if you're doing four bypass grafts at the same time in other operations or patient that I used it on, there was an AVR and a mitral valve who uh, had a FEV1 of 0 0.7 and a 25 percent ejection fraction. So in cases like that, I think that uh, for clinical reasons, you do have benefits. But I don't use it in everyone. Dr. Gerstack, what are your thoughts? Yes, so I agree completely with uh, Dr. McCarty. So what we found out is that uh, uh, the patients are, are uh, sensitive to cross clamp time, of course. Nobody wants to have a longer cross clamp time. Yeah. Uh, but we found out that uh, individual experience of the surgeons, if they are using the sutureless valves, they can reduce their individual cross clamp by, uh, time by, by 40%. So uh, this is extremely important in minimal invasive surgery because you can easily have a, in right anterior thoracotomy with a classical valve 1.5 hours, let's say, uh, cross clamp time. But in sutureless valve, you can have it like uh, 40 minutes, which is a big, big, big difference. Well, as we close, I want to get both of your final thoughts on what you think the future of the sutureless or rapid deployment technology will be. We'll start off with Dr. McCarthy. Um, so this is still pretty early generation, and I think that it's, its merits will prove itself over the next sort of five years and stuff. There's still some little tweaks I would want them to do to the valve. I don't like the way we bring the snugger down and it's so close to the holder, so you have to stop and really make sure that you don't uh, have a problem with that. Uh, but those are fairly small engineering feats that they have to go through. I think what it'll probably do is lead to wider adoption of minimally invasive aortic valve surgery around the U.S. Dr. Gersak, your thoughts? Well, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, Percival has now the largest clinical experience uh, and we are waiting now for 10 years results. Now we have nine years results, and until now the results are really perfect. So now we will see what will happen after 10, 12, 13, 14 years. And if the results will be good, then I think it's going to be a really a complete game changer for the whole surgical world. What we can expect is, of course, probably simpler, uh, simple, simpler devices to, to deploy the VAM, much user-friendly. Uh, and eventually, I think for both, for the rapid deployment and for the sutureless valve, uh, if the price will go down, there will be no real uh, reason why not to implant them. Absolutely. Well, it's a really exciting time to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. There's transcatheter valve technology, and now there's emerging sutureless and rapid deployment technology. And uh, we're very appreciative to have two leading experts in the field share their experience with, uh, with the Edwards Intuity valve and the, uh, the personal valve. Uh, thank you so much for, for both of your time. Uh, as we sign out from Houston, Texas at the STS. Thanks for having us. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.